Dr. Armour Bear, for those who missed out on today's class, can catch the replay for Wednesday. The Armour Bear, um, back, in the, back in the days, the Armour Bear was a person responsible for the care of a king, officer, or leader. Back in Bible days, an armor bearer was a person responsible for the care of a king, officer, or a leader. His job was to refresh, protect, and assist the officer. Servant, bodyguard, friend, companion, butler, cook, and confidant are just a few names that can also be um, our roles that can also term who an armor bearer is. So an armor bearer is expected to be a servant that will serve the officer king leader. Uh, they serve also as a bodyguard. When it is needed, they can also serve as a loyal friend, a companion where needed. They may serve as a butler. They may serve as a cook or a confidant, as an armor bearer for a leader or a king. There will definitely be moments where the king or the leader or the officer will be caught in a vulnerable or a low state. And the person, the armor bearer, they must be able to hold certain confident information, cover for that leader, so on and so forth, and remain and also remain respectable as an armor bearer. So there are certain armor bearers, uh, if they see their leader in a particular state, uh, in a down state, a broken state, you must, be conf you must be able to withhold and hold certain information that you have seen. It's not to go to someone and say, oh, you know, I was praying for pastor yesterday, or, or, or I was up at pastor's house yesterday, and I was helping, and this is what I saw, this is what I heard. No, that's not the duty of an armor bearer. You're called to be a confidant. You're called to hold certain discreet information and to cover for the king officer or leader that you're armor bearing for. Now, armor bearing, I have seen where a lot of people have uh, done away with the term armor bearing. Uh, they say that there, there's no need for armor bearers, but it is actually biblical. I'll share a few um, scriptures with you quickly, and I'll read them if time allows. You can write the scriptures down so you can read on your own timing. Uh, Jonathan, in First Samuel, First Samuel 14, uh, we see Jonathan's armor bearer. It says, Jonathan said, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, the word is actually in the Bible. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outposts of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by any, whether by many or a few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said, go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. His armor bearer said, I'm with you, heart and soul, and that's very deep. So Jonathan had an armor bearer. Abimelech's armor bearer, Judges chapter 9. Judges chapter 9. Next, Abimelech went to Thepas and beside, beside it and captured it. Inside the city, however, was a strong tower to which all men and women, all the people of the city fled. They locked themselves in and climbed up on the tower roof. Abimelech went to the tower and stormed it. But as he approached the entrance to the tower to set it on fire, a woman dropped an upper miles millstone on his head and crushed his skull. Hurriedly, he called to his armor bearer, draw your sword and kill me so that they can't say a woman killed me. So his servant ran through and he died. Can you imagine that? The armor bearer had to kill him so that it is not said that another woman did. That is keeping honor to the king's name. That is maintaining the honor to the king's name, my God. That's powerful. Saul's armor bearer. 1 Samuel 31 and verse 4. Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and run with me through or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. 
but his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. 1 Samuel 31 and verse 4. Now there's David, 1 Samuel chapter 16. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my presence, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit of the Lord, whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take his harp and play, and relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. As you have said earlier on that, you know, we don't really use the word armor bearer more. No, I'm just, it just come to me that maybe because a lot of persons don't trust persons, trust issue is in the body of Christ. So these things are not talked about or these, um, these, these positions are not given to persons. I remember myself at one of my previous work. One of the manager, you know, she trusts me that much and we have a good relationship. And what happened, because a lot of persons knew that, yeah, she's an evangelist, so you know, she's truthful and she ain't gonna lie or anything like that. So my manager was, she was going through, you know, stuff. And she planned that, you know, she's going to resign and she's going to get another job. Now, she tell me all this. And because everybody knew that I'm close to her, when persons start to get a little hint that she was leaving, everybody rushed to me to ask me if it is true. No, poor me, hear me, God forgive me, but I cannot let her down. So when, when I was asked, I said, I don't know, ask her. But in truth and in fact, yes, she did tell me. And I tell you this, this was the first time I'm having an outer body experience. And this thing rests on me for the week. And I said, God, I tell lie. Because they're asking me, and yes, I know, but I cannot tell them. And when I went to church that particular Sunday, it rested on me so much. I was like, oh my God, the entire week I tell a lie and look at me now in your presence. I feel bad. Me not even want to worship. But what happened? I prayed and I said, God, forgive me. You know, I cannot talk. And the Sunday night, I was between like, you know, when you're sleeping, but, you know, it's like in between sleep and wake. And I prayed, and I felt, I felt when my, my, my inner man come out of me. Come out of me, and there was, this per, there was this person talking to me and said, like, he called my name and said, Alicia, you're, you keep asking for me. Here am I. But I cannot see the face. It was just a mirror, mirror that I was seeing. And I was so frightened. And when I said, who is it? The boy said, you keep on asking, you keep on asking for forgiveness of what happened. And I forgive you and you keep on asking me, asking me the same question. So you're asking me, here am I? And miss, I was so frightened. I was so frightened and I was like, okay, Lord, okay, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for forgiving me. And then eventually I'm trying to look to see where is this man, you know, where he is. And then my, my inner body come back to me. And then I woke up, up right now. And I was like, oh my God, imagine I pray and ask you for forgiveness and you forgive me and me keep bothering you. That's going to show up to me in this way that my inner man leave me. And you talk to me that way. So I think trust issue is the reason why we don't have armor bearers around. I think there's a lot of recovery and healing that needs to take place in the body of Christ. And um, 
the truth is it is difficult. I, I don't know if, well, obviously back in the days, people were very cruel and, and very awful, just as no. But I do believe that in this, see, in this time, this day and age that we're living in, that the heart of man has truly, really walked school. And there's very few people that you can really, really trust. And so there's, there's actually no rush to say, oh, Oh, I'm a pastor. Let me find a right hand. Let me find someone that can serve me and so on and so forth. No, I've been through some things where I've listened, I've been hurt, and I'm at a place where if it takes me 10 years, I, I, I preach it all the time and I say it all the time. Let me, let me get to 10 years, 5, 10 years, and I can see the person that has come with me from day one to now they're still here. Then I can truly say, this is really an armor bearer. This is really someone I can trust. But you don't just get up overnight, and unless the Lord sends somebody, because there are times where the Lord will truly send someone, and you will know that this person is sent by God, and you can trust this person with anything whatsoever and they have your back um they'll pray you they'll cover you and all of that but um where church is concerned it is something that we have to be very careful of and even so sometimes the dysfunction becomes so bad that even though you have been hurt where genuine people come to help if you're not healed and you have not recovered then you will begin to push away those who are truly coming to help and so, um, as I said before, a lot of healing and recovery needs to be done in the church and in the body of Christ. Um, yes, yeah, Charmaine said David was an armor bearer for Saul. Revelation. Uh, revelation for me, I never knew. Yes, um, David was an armor bearer. First Samuel 16, it says that David became an armor bearer. Um, very, very powerful. I think many of us, we need to begin to read the Bible again from Genesis to Revelation. Each time you read, you get something new that you did not see the first time. All right, um, let's go to, to Kings, Second Kings, Second Kings 3, verse 13. But Jehoshaphat asked, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord through him? An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. So Elijah was not present because Elisha was his armor bearer or successor. It was expected that Elisha would be able to do the same task that his father would also do. So armor bearers are armor bearers can be expected to be not just the right hand, but they should be able to stand in the gap of that particular pastor or leader. If something should happen to them, if they come in, so they should be able to fill in where needed and if needed. Because it makes no sense you are operating as an armor bearer or a right hand for somebody. And if the pastor doesn't come, you can't fill in. Why, where is the oil that is dropping from the head to the shoulder? What is it that you're getting? Why are you close to the pastor? And do, are, are you just close to the pastor so you can know pastor's business? Or are you close to the pastor so if pastor can't preach one day, you can fill in? So there's so much needs. There's so much that um, can be learned and should be learned from all of this. I used to be armor bearer for my spiritual father. Um, in 2000 and 2007, or two th I think 2000, 2008, I met this man, Evangelist Carlton Daly. And since then, uh, he has been a spiritual father. Um, just since recently, we haven't connected like that. Um, I used to armor bearer. And by this, when we went to crusades, um, he operates in deliverance. And if someone falls, it was my duty, along with my other brothers and sisters, to make sure that they're covered, to help with deliverance on the ground, and so on and so forth. Uh, whenever we went home, I'd make sure I want I want to take daddy's shoes off. I want to make sure I'm putting on daddy's tea. If clothes need to be ironed, let me iron your clothes. And we were just all there as a big family in that house together because all of us stayed in one house. If we were preaching, if his jacket was to come off, I realized he's trying to pull his jacket off. Me first want to take the jacket off, not because I'm a slave girl or I'm a sender girl, but when I take the jacket off, I can pull it on if I want. There was, let me share something with you. There was one, um, there was one particular night that there was a heavy impartation for armor bearers. I remember that he fell out under the anointing and uh, 
everyone that went close to him, the first person that went close to him to take off his shoes fell out, completely knocked out in the anointing. That night was very high. So there are two persons knocked out on the ground. One of my other brothers, um, Omar, they went. And when they went and they tried to help the other one, knocked out completely. And I'm standing and looking like, what the hell is going on? About, I think, um, Anna K when they got knocked out. A couple of the persons went, everybody got knocked out. Eventually, someone actually went, managed to take them up. They all went into the office. The office was kind of something like that. And here I am. Everybody's gone. One of my brothers went to the door to open the door to go in. Because if everybody's locked up, then uh, th we were like that, like a family. So when they went to the door to go in to find out if they could help or anything, I remember Anna Kay particularly, when she, they left from out of the church and they went around to the office. When she touched the door knob, she fell completely out. And I said, okay, let me go and see if I can help. At this point, I wasn't thinking, let me partake, but let me really go to help because this is serious. By the time I got to the office door to hold onto the door to go in, I fell completely. We were there until 1 a.m. Nothing, nobody could move. The place was just in total. It was like a supernatural electric shock that was happening. We never left church that morning until 1 a.m. And we were traveling from a place called Dysel in Clarendon all the way to a place called, I think it was Alexandria. Um, back St. Anne's side at 1 a.m. And in those days, we were driving in a car. It was like 10 of us in a car that seats, what, three, four in the back. There's a little trunk, and about five of us used to sit in the trunk. But wherever Daddy goes, we're going because we must make sure that Daddy is okay. That's how serious we took armor bearing. At the end of the day, I remember there was a particular point in time where there were some people in my community. They used to um, call me sheet girl. And they used to say, anywhere Vanji go, ya debaka Vanji. Even got to a point where they began to say, oh, Vanji sleeping with all these young women. I don't know of anything like that. Um, that was not coined to me, but they did say that I was a she girl. And I had to post, recently I had to post on Facebook. And I said, this is the she girl. I'm no longer a she girl unless I want to do that in my church. But after everything that I have done as an armor bearer, it wasn't just armor bearing, but you were actually getting something you were getting the oil you were in that atmosphere where something could have been imparted to you and so i share this to say that whoever is working close to a pastor or you're working with someone it's not just that you're serving but whatever falls from the head will fall to the shoulders every single one of us are pastoring every one of them are pastoring or in serious ministry every one of the brothers pastoring i've never seen anything like it is it's one of the most amazing whether we are connected as um spiritual father and daughter or not it is something that i've never i've never seen anything like this before or after seriously go ahead carlito you know fun you said that like two years ago that same thing happened we went to a place we up in um I think it was St. Anne's. Same thing what you were talking. With Carl and Daly. Carl and Richie. Daly, yes. And it was not Richie. They went to a, a convention. And he invited some of us and we went there. And I'm telling you, like everybody in the room just not followed. Video. One person went in to help because he left his jacket. Well, he threw his jacket on me and left it with me and went inside. And me said, if I didn't go inside, nobody couldn't come back out like this. Everybody, when you're going there, people on top of people, on top of people, on top of people, on top of people. Like, everybody who got the door, like, everybody just stood up in that church and said, I'm not going there. <laughs> I'm going yeah, there. Yeah, man, it's serious. Yeah, and we didn't leave there till about 2 o'clock in the morning because people were just slain in the spirit and nobody. And I'm saying it's for real. Everybody that you said, everybody that I knew that he taught, he shared with us. They have a church for them. So yeah. That is so true. Yes. When we used to have retreat at St. Anne's at the Duff, um, the deaf, um, the deaf school. Yes. It, 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 it has always been an amazing encounter. 
I've probably seen you guys there before because I've never missed a retreat. So we have we have seen each other in some past time because I've never missed a retreat. We used to wake like, was it like 5 or 4 for morning glory? Remember morning glory? And it used to be crazy. It used to be a crazy experience. Um, the whole armor bearing and the fellowship together, it was so much. They went to um, somewhere in Kingston for a crusade. I was not there. And I remember they never want there. There were some Don Lars and Obia people that never wanted him there. And I remember the warfare became so serious that, that he called me and he said to me, he said, listen, there's a warfare being launched upon me. And this thing will affect all the armor bears. It's serious. Everybody had serious vomiting and diarrhea. They were not with him. Persons were in St. Anne, persons were in West Milan, and everybody got sick. I had diarrhea, I had vomiting, everybody sick because it was a serious warfare. And we were connected, it was like it was contagious because we were connected by spirit. I've never seen a spiritual bond or a spiritual connection that ran so deep before. And so, this is how powerful armor bearing is. Okay, so she's asking if I would recommend that, um, for example, myself as a pastor, my husband is an armor bearer. Uh, he definitely, I don't know if I would call him an armor bearer, but he does serve as one. If I go somewhere, I've been places to minister. Before we had baby, I've been places to minister. And while I'm doing altar work and stuff, he's actually there working, helping to anoint, catching people because he knows how I function. So he does help. By all means, I do, I do say, if you are married, um, once you're going to do ministry and your spouse is there that can help in ministry, by all means, there should be an armor bearer that can cover you. Not, and, and remember, when I say armor bearing, I don't mean that they're always going to be catching people or whatever, but they're standing with you to cover you, to protect you. So when you move, they move so no one can uh, come close to harm you or anything like that. So they're definitely, I, my, de, my husband is definitely an armor bearer. There's a man that came here one Sunday that had this crystal ball thing and he had something in his socks, I think. I don't know. I was told that he would probably was going to stab me or something like that. And my husband was around there and he ca the man was walking here. I don't know how he got up here so fast and began to ush him out. But that's definitely the role of an armor bearer. Or maybe he's just been a husband. That's what husbands do also. But it is definitely also the role of an armor bearer. Absolutely. So we see Elisha um, as an armor bearer. Uh, Joshua chapter 1, we see Joshua as an armor bearer for Moses. In Acts chapter 4, we see um, Barnabas being an armor bearer also. Acts chapter 6. So you can read those on your timing. All right, so I'm going to give you a few rules of armor bearers. They must provide strength for his or her leader. By strength, I mean uh, presence is always strength. The fact that your armor bearers are standing uh, next to you, they're standing there preaching with you, that is definitely strength to the minister as he preaches. So as an armor bearer, if you go out to speak with um, your leader or your in church, I do not believe that armor bearers should be seated while their minister is preaching. Armor bearers should always be on the guard, on the stand. Uh, when I used to armor bear for my spiritual father, my feet used to hurt so much because once he starts to preach, I dare not sit down. And it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't spoken. It was just given. I just knew within myself. Uh, let me find my corner there and I'm just monitoring. If he begins to walk down the aisle, by the time he begins to go, I move from there and I'm here. I'm, I give him the space to go, but I'm always making sure that I am close enough so if anything should happen, and at that point, you should have seen me, maga bad. Hey, me di maga, you know, I was so skinny. 
being a, can you imagine what could I even do to protect him as an armor bear being so skinny? But I felt as though my presence being there, it was some form of encouragement. It was some form of strength and power. So um, definitely, armor bearer provides strength for leaders. Armor bearers must instinctively understand his leader's thoughts. Armor bearers, they have the instincts to understand their leader's thoughts. This is why not just, this is why it can't be just about anyone that is appointed as an armor bearer. You must know your pastor and your leader so much in that you can, you can know what next he's going to do. So after, and the, I think these, th these things come with experience. Over a period of time of serving with your leader, you know the type of leader he is. When you realize that your leader begins to go to a plateau to a certain level, you know, hey, let me go and take his shoes off. Uh, let me go and stand behind him. Because uh, my pastor is a type of pastor. When he begins to preach extremely hard, he goes on top of a chair or something like that. Carlton Daly used to love going on chairs. So we had to make sure once he starts climbing, make sure that you stand behind him because he's going to go on a chair and it's a pussy. He didn't even care careful will fall over and they will be standing and holding him. That man is a crazy reckless man. Um, so it is very, very important that you get to know your leader, how your leader function. Uh, be, know your leader. For example, uh, you might have a leader that flows deeply in the prophetic or if there's a need for it while, like uh, while the minister is ministering and he begins to go into the congregation, you may never know if he's going to lay hand on someone and by the time he lays hand on someone they may fall over. But you can't be uh, miles or a couple feet apart where you miss out on something. Especially if you know that it is time for like altar work. Never leave your pastor hanging. Listen up been to I've been to churches before where I've had to just go in preach no ministration just leave because I can't put myself in trouble I've come here before back in um, back in the older days where it's Friday night meetings I've had Friday night meetings I've wanted to do ministry and I couldn't for this reason I started telling people when you feel the presence of God coming kneel down before you fall because we got to a point where I realized that when the atmosphere began to peak people just started falling People were just falling and no one was there to actually catch them. So I started telling people, if you feel the presence of God coming upon you, kneel before you fall. Had a few late, I had a lady fell over there and hit her head so badly. This church is not insured. So if someone falls, I've seen, you know, I've, I've watched this thing overseas where a lady went to church, fell, hit her head, and they were suing the pastor. I can't take that right now. So I said, just kneel down or sit down before you fall. Um, I went to a church to preach in Kingston. The same thing happened. I couldn't do ministry because I realized as soon as I started to climb, and I have one of the videos on Facebook, people were just falling here, there, there, everywhere. And the arm, I had armor bearers, but they were not enough to catch as many people that were falling at a particular time. There are times you can't help it. People will just fall as the anointing comes. But this is why having armor bearers are very important. Armor bearers must be able to move swiftly. You can't jump over a chair. You can't run. It's not your duty. You have to be able to move swift based on instinct, based on how your leader operates. An armor bearer, they repel any kind of attack against officer especially his back so they repel any kind of attacks against his officer especially his back so an armor bearer always have the back of the leader or officer and they're always able are always ready to take a hit on behalf of that person and that's a very serious thing you your heart and your soul must be put into armor bearing for you to say hey i'll take a lick for pastor I'll take a hit for pastor any day. Uh, this is what armor bearing was back in the days when the kings would go to war and armor bearers would go. If there was an arrow that was being thrown or a bullet or whatever it is, they would jump in front and they would take it on behalf of a king. In these days, you don't find people doing that. People, hey, I have a wife, I have kids to live for. 
do you go and take what you have to take or whatever? Me not put myself in a no trouble for no pastor. So it's very rare um, that you actually find people who are truly uh, sold out for the cause to serve a man or a woman of God. Our bearers, they keep watch while officers rest. This was especially when um, they used to go to war back in the Bible days. They keep watch while officers rest. And I find this with um, a prophet that I know. I find this with his ministry. He has intercessors who are praying around the clock. So when he gets a chance to go to sleep, intercessors are constantly praying. And one of the things he said, the reason why he functions so deeply in the prophetic is not just because he is graced, but he has a group of armor bearers who are constantly praying for him. So there's a prayer line at 6, we're on the prayer line. Once I can, at 6, prayer line. By 11, prayer line. By 3, prayer line. By 6 a.m., there's another set on the prayer line. So prayer is always going up for him. So because of that, he's always covered. He's, he flows very heavily in deliverance and prophetic because there's a team that is constantly praying. And that I, f I think that is very powerful and a very amazing thing takes time to build but a very powerful thing so while he's resting he has a team that is praying uh, constantly uh armor bearers cares for their leaders belongings so whether it be bible clothes car whatever it is if needs be they make sure that they care for their leaders belongings they react with total intolerance to any false accusation against officers or rulers so if there's accusation or gossip or any threat or anything at all, they operate in total intolerance to anything that goes against their leader. Go ahead. All right. When you make mention of um, for the armor bearer that they take care of their leader's belonging, would it be in a case where as an armor bearer, you would, for example, if you go out, for example, you might go shopping and you see stuff that, you know, would fit in for your armor bearer, you would get that for your armor bearer? Or is it that, you know, as you mentioned earlier on? No, that's not what I mean. Cleaning up the clothes. I, I mean in terms of, okay, let's say back in Bible days, if a king would, they would go to war and the king would go to sleep, then the armor bearers, as I said, while the, uh, while the king or the officer is sleeping, they would make sure they watch and protect. At this point in time, they will be able to put over his belongings. So they ensure that while he's sleeping, things are covered. A uh, modern example in church, if I am preach, for example, and I have an armor bearer, I have a thing where once I really begin to preach, I kick my shoes off, ensure that my shoes are taken up, put up to a certain place, because people tend to steal things sometimes. I've gone to places to preach, and I don't come back with my jacket. Th listen, if you know me and you know me, if you know me and you know me very well, I, I never preach without a scarf. I have scarf for every dress, every occasion I have a scarf. See how she's in her scarf. I would have a scarf for everything. Gold, silver, you name it. But I got to a point where I have lost all of them. I've been to churches and people have said to me, can I have your jacket? Okay, are you sure you want it? Okay, go. Uh, the same for shoes. Listen, you will go places and you will really minister and people will take, people will, they will, I've been to a church to minister before and there was a young lady named Ali. She wanted my scarf. By the time she wanted the scarf, the amount of young people came. If I had followed them, I would have gone home naked. <laughs> I'd have literally gone home naked. They would have taken everything. Prophetess, can I have your watch? Prophetess, prophet, what, prophetess what are you giving me? These people were very serious. It was a good time. But um, they, they monitor. Um, this is why you have armor bearers. So a lot of times, sometimes people will come 
and they're not necessarily coming because they want to take your stuff for the anointing. But other times, they, if they know that pastor always take off the shoes or whatever, a lot of times people will come and they will try to steal the shoes for witchcraft, for obia, or you name it. So you have to be very careful with these things. Also, when you pull off your jacket, people will come and even try to slip something inside. So a lot of things happen where church and ministry is concerned that we always have to be very, um, very watchful and monitor. All right, so another role of the armor bearer is they demonstrate extreme loyalty. They demonstrate extreme loyalty. So armor bearers are loyal. They are dedicated to the task. If they have something to do, they are doing it. Um, for example, if we have church on Sunday, church begins at 10 there's no way armor bearers can be rolling in that 11, 12 o'clock. Armor bearers should be there already waiting and praying and you name it. Armor bearers are loyal to the end. And I did mention this one before that armor bearers, they have their pastors back. Okay, I have another one here. It says, an armor bearer is one who will try to keep their pastor from making too many mistakes. You know, I was watching a show recently, and there was, there was, a, there was a young lady, her father, she never knew her father, but her father died, and they found her. And a multi-million dollar company was handed over to her to run. Now, she knew very little about running a company, but the, f the father had a right hand, had a man that served with him. So when he died, the, he, he, when he died, he did not quit, but he became the daughter's right hand. So he was the person that many persons would have thought, okay, he's going to run the company now. Or for many persons, they would say, it's my time to run the company. I've been with you from the get-go. I know everything about the company. But he did not do that. He began to train the daughter how to become the new CEO. A lot of people would say, I've been serving you for so long. I know the ins and outs of the company. I've been with you for years. It's not my time. But no, there was a daughter, and so he trained her. It's the same thing for pastoring. For example, I'm new to pastoring. So let's say Sister Carlita, for example, has been working alongside a leader in church for many years. When I come in, no, it's your duty to help me to run church, even though I'm a pastor. So you can say, hey, pastor, this is what we do. Every first Sunday, Lord's Supper. Every second Sunday, this is what we do. They just have a board meeting and do this and do that and I say okay no problem it's not that you're trying to control me or you are the leader because what I say go but you're still instructing and teaching how to get certain things done as as odd as it may sound because the truth is a lot of people will say if you're called to be a pastor then you should know uh, how to run church how to run your own church how to do this how to do that you don't need someone to do this for you and all of that but that is actually not the case and in very rare cases, you will actually find this kind of relationship. Because one, the person that knows everything wants to be the leader. And two, the leader might not get as much respect because he is seen as someone who should know and, um, and all of that. So they, they, they teach them and uh, cover for them and support them to make the right decisions and so on and so forth. All right, two more. I am not sure how much I support this one, but I'll still put it out there. It says, one who will try to meet their pastor's need when asked without or without being asked. Now, Alicia, this is what you asked um, earlier. If you go out and you see something that looks like pastor or whatever, or you see something that, oh, pastor would do well with this, then I could get it, or if pastor asks to do this or do that, then you're actually able to do it. So armor bearers, they are able to meet their pastor's need when asked or without being asked. So it's not a case that your pastor is always going to ask you to 
spend your money to do this, to do that. But if needs be, they should be able to ask the armor bearer to fill in on something. Uh, or the other way around, armor bearers are so intact with their leader that if you see something to be done, you don't even wait to be asked uh, to, to, to get it done. Uh, one more, an armor bearer is willing to sacrifice their own need or comfort to help their pastor achieve their goals. And I'll tell you about this, you know. When I was armor bearing with, um, with Vanji, there were days where he was in the anointing and he was standing there, times when he would be preaching and he would get so weak from preaching and I had to stand something like this and hold on and I had to be bracing him and for hours and for how long I'm standing like this and because he's bigger than we are to be standing and holding him like because he's leading on you but you have to stand and bear him up you're like a column bearing him up and I had to hold that thing listen for days my muscles would be aching I'm just saying um, physically and also not physically we have to sometimes sacrifice uh, certain things to achieve a particular goal or get to a particular vision uh back in the days this is just one that i was reading on scripture this morning back in the days armor bearers they would not their leaders they would carry their leaders um what do you call it weapons for war like swords and so on and so forth the armor bearers would take that when i saw a weapon then i instantly thought of bible I was saying last week that this is why in many churches you will find that their armor bearers, they don't allow their pastors to take their own Bibles. Um, they would make sure that their pastor is exiting the office. If you know it's time for your pastor to go on, there are certain people, they will take their pastor's water, drinks, Bible, and so on to the pulpit. When he's finished, then he would do the opposite um, back. Uh, you don't see it happening a whole lot because um, no days pastors don't use Bibles anymore they use phones um, so it's difficult for a lot of leaders to actually do that but uh, also the other side if they don't have a Bible most times you will find that when the leader is going up their armor bearers were walking with their leader to go up this is why you find that there's so much idolatry in the body of Christ I've been to churches before and I've seen where when the leader is going up there are young men or young women who are going up with them and when they get to the pulpit they would kneel down and the minister would sit and they would not get up from their knees until the minister sits and so we take this thing to a place of idolatry this is why many leaders do not want armor bearers or this is why it is done away with with armor bearing because there are some people that say man i worship no pastor or you understand what i'm saying and i think we do need to implement these things because it's not it shouldn't be a thing of idolatry but it should be a thing of honor or a thing of respect why do why do for example why do i get why do i bring a guest speaker into my church when my guest speaker come i'm if prophet burning comes here god forbid i must make sure that when he exit the car outside i'm walking him inside if he's going into the office i will insist if possible i'm opening the door for him and when it is time for him to go and speak i am walking him up to the platform unless he says to me it is okay why should i have a guest speaker come into my church get all this honor and i am the pastor of this church and i don't even get that honor do you get what i'm saying what, what I'm trying to say is the same honor you I would give to or we would give to a guest speaker. Your pastor should also get the same honor. The same thing should be done. And we need to learn to instill honor because honor is what will bless and will open doors for many people. A lot of times it is not the laying of hands. It's not the prophecy. It's the fact that you can honor the man or the woman of God that will unlock certain blessings into your life. So we must learn to instill honor. Where there is honor, there's also the presence of God because there is honor, there's honor and respect. It is a currency. That's how you get a prophet's reward. I went to see, I went to see um, one of my uh, daughters the other day. Hi, Natasha. I went to see uh, one of my daughters the other day, and I know that they were finances are concerned. There's a little, you know, and 
I went, and when I went, and I saw food galore. They went shopping. They bought KFC, pizza, fruits, and ice cream. You list it. And I said, you never had to do this. But hey, pasta is coming over. Let me honor. Before I left, I had to say, this house must have a profit reward. Because there is honor that was done. It is idolatry. You see, for everything that is good, may God help this house and may God help me as a leader. For everything that is good, the devil will try to create a camouflage that will distort the good. This is where idolatry comes in. Back in the days, if you were going to see a prophet, you dare not go to the prophet empty-handed. Remember when, when, when Saul, when Kish's donkeys were lost and he sent his son Saul to go find the asses. When they were going to see Samuel the seer, his servant said, let us get some shekels and some coins and money and whatever and bring to him. Because we dare not go to the prophet empty-handed. It is now that the devil has distorted and tainted honoring the prophet of God that there's so some prophets that say, hey, if you need a prophecy, you must pay me. There's a difference between pay and honor. So nowadays, people will not honor the prophet because they see it as pain or pain for a prophet or buying a prophecy rather. But it should not be the case. You should not come to the house of God empty-handed. Or go to the prophet for the prophet to pray for you or anything. Seek counsel. Don't go empty-handed. And this is why many of us, we go to prophets and leaders for prayer and advice and we leave and they give us, but we still can't put it into, into play or manifestation because there was no honor. Years ago, my husband and I were in a place of financial deficit and we needed uh, counseling and stuff. We were just about to get married and we needed counsel. And we went to go see a woman all the way in some place in Sri Lanka, way up Timbuktu. And we had no money. And I remember I, when I got to Falmouth, I saw this fruit stall. And I said, let us try to get some fruit. Just let me go. Let me get the prettiest, the best fruit. But just help me not to go empty-handed. We had to dig up for some coins and stuff just to get something. Because we are going to the prophet because we needed help. And this was just a couple years ago, like what, seven years ago? Six, seven years ago. So this is, these are some of the things that we have pushed aside that we need to begin to implement and reinstall within church and within the body of Christ to honor people. If I'm going to a prophet's house, if I'm ever going to meet a prophet or going to a prophet's house, I must make sure that I carry fruit. This is why when we had our conference last year, our um, and first anniversary last year, when Prophet Carter came, he brought a basket with nuts and fruits and books and so on because he said, I cannot come to your house and not take a gift. There's always something. So I'm, I'm also teaching you, if you're going to a prophet to seek help or counsel or prayer or advice, take a blessing. You're not, don't think of it as paying the prophet. Think of it as honor. When you think of it as honor, even if it's a thousand dollars, it is coming from the heart as honor. If you think of it as pay, you will try to say, okay, let me find 10,000. Well, you don't need to come with 10,000, but you can come with 2,000 as honor. When you think of it as pay, you want to think of something that they will appreciate or that this is what they might want. That's not the case. So we need to learn to honor and in honoring that we might also be honored and favored. All right, so that's Arma Bearing. Carletta, did I leave out anything? <laughs> All right, so I think I've touched on... Um, Most of the major roles and so forth where armor bearing is concerned that I can think of on the top of my head and that I have written down. Uh, armor bearers, they also assist with altar working. I don't want to coin altar bearing and altar workers together, but they can serve uh, the same purpose uh, to assist with uh, persons being covered. I do believe that for armor bearers and altar workers that males should assist male, females should assist female where possible. If we have a guest speaker and the guest speaker is a female, send a female to greet the female, walk the female in, other than sending a male to greet the female. I've been to numerous churches 
and the pastor or they send a mail to greet and they want to find out are you married the the compliments begin to come in how beautiful you are you look nice your skirt your this your none of that is necessary uh those who try to hold your hands end up touching you in the wrong places uh those who want to get to know you the contact all of that is completely unnecessary so we must try to avoid these things as much as possible another thing is uh, armor bearers is also needed to cover speakers for example i went to a church um some time ago to minister in tower tower house in kingston when i got there there were a lot of young people that they wanted to meet they knew that i was coming they wanted to meet me some wanted to get my telephone number so on and so forth and I remember they bam rushed me. I was leaving. I was just finished preaching, leaving the office. They bam rushed me around a corner. And I remember pastor, the pastor came and he just run them. And he was like, oh no, come here, come here, come here. Didn't I tell you guys when I get speaker come, allow the speaker to come and preach and leave freely. Do not bother the speaker to pray for you or for the number. Do not do that when I get speaker come. Oh no, frighten for prophecy. Do I not pro He dealt with them. He dealt with them. I felt so good. <laughs> I felt so good. He dealt with them. I do not like to see it. When I get speaker come, for some of you, for example, some of you follow Prophet Barnings on Facebook. When he comes, give the man some space. Let him come and preach and go. If he wants to prophesy to you, he'll prophesy to you. Or if you want to have a meeting with him to discuss something with him, tell your pastor or tell your leaders, is it possible I can have a meeting with the prophet before he leaves and let it, put, let it be put into, um, let us organize it. There are certain protocol and principles that must be followed. And there are certain people that don't understand it. They don't understand protocol. They do not understand principle. So that's very important. Um, so armor bearers also assist with that. You know something where uh, Africa, and this is why I don't know if the Lord will move me to Africa at some point in time, but if he doesn't, I do hope that he will cause me to be in Africa for at least a year or two to serve there. In Africa, there is, I've never been there, but based on what I have seen, observed, and heard, there's so much honor in Africa. It's not even funny. We take some things for granted. I've been to some I've been to some churches to minister. When I go there to minister, I say, my people, uh, I Carlita, you said it to me some time ago that your people, some people, they don't know what they have or who they have as a leader. I've been to churches before and I don't want to toot my own horn. But when I go to certain churches to minister, I said, Wow, some of my people they really do not know what they have. One of, one, of, um, one of my colleagues, well, not colleagues, but one of the elder ministers went to Africa some time ago to minister. And when he went to Africa, listen, the way that they were around him, you would think that they are, they, you would literally think that they are worshiping him as a God. It was not worship, it was honor. They're not used to, they're not used to, yeah, first of all, they're not, they're not used to leaders dressing a certain way because to them, him rich because he's actually wearing a full suit. The second thing is when he wakes up in the morning, they're cooking, they're cleaning. It's like they want to lay out a red carpet for him. And if you're not careful when you go to minister they will roll out a red carpet it is for some of them it's not worship when the car comes in with the speaker there's a crowd of people because a prophet is in town listen there are some things uh when he said that when he was getting when they were about to have service uh and this he said struck him because in jamaica you're not find that unless there's serious discipline he said church stars at 10 and when he was getting ready to go to church at 10 they were in the sanctuary praying and worshiping and dancing from 8 a.m and church start at 10. they were there because they were waiting and anticipating and when service began, they were dancing like they were dancing like they hear that God is coming tomorrow. They're trying to get it right. They were honoring any move he made. They were there honoring us, serving him. And he said, "Me not used to this." He said he was there and he felt like, "Oh God, no, don't do it. Me not used to it." Because when I'm home, nobody not care about me as pastor. He said, "You know what? I came with a suitcase. I may go home. Me not care. No go home. Me leave." everything he came with the enter he went to the entire suitcase and he said the way that these people need it he's not going home with anything and he said you know what i'm going to the supermarket that they have around the local store i'm there 
empty my bank account and me fill them with toothpaste and stuff. Because they don't they, um, uh, soap. He said soap. Because the soap, the soap bar that we have, they don't have like those soap bars. They cut them, they cut up that one single soap bar that you have, they cut it up. You know the little piece where you have on your journey with that next little piece to make one when you run out and you know go supermarket yet? That's what they buy as soap and they make it serve. He said, I'm emptying my bank account and then he opened up this thing where people could send him money through PayPal and so on that he could shop for them. Anna, Africa. Go ahead, Carlito. You know what I've learned? Um, honor is not a gift. It's a virtue. Mm. That is what they, they understood. And the first time I saw it, I cried tears because I remember um, I followed this gentleman. His name is David, David Yedipo. And his son, they, his son was taking the offering. And he just, when he was taking the offering, he bowed. And I'm saying, I may say, I've never seen it like this before. Like every time I was watching, I would see them bow. And like when he came up to the podium or he's going up to where his father is, he would bow before he speak to him. Every time I'm saying, my God, I've never seen it like this before. But I watch them and I see exactly what you're saying, prophetess. Exactly what you're saying. Something what we need to take out of them book because this is something we always say we, we need to go into people's well and take out things out of people's well and begin to add it to your life. This is what they do. They appreciate the man of God or the woman of God who sets over their life. If you begin to do that, you reap a harvest of benefit in your life. But I'm just leaving this with you this today. Honor is not a gift. It is a virtue. And that is what they they believe in. That is why they reap so much. Yes. Absolutely. And as, as I said, a lot of us, our heart is just so wicked. We speak in tongues and we say that we're Holy Ghost filled. But our heart is so wicked and cruel because we're thinking, uh, me not about to no pastor, me not do this, uh, pastor rich off from it. These are the mentality and the, the thoughts that many of us have. Um, I, I was at I was at the stadium in Kingston a couple of years ago for that annual gala thing, and I remember at one point when the prime minister in, prime minister walked in, everybody stood up, everybody stood, and I thought of, I, I was thinking about it before. The Holy Spirit said when I enter a church or when I enter the house, people are people barely recognize and people barely stand. It's the same thing. If the prime minister should walk in here now and every everybody would stand. But if your pastor comes in and goes on the pulpit, people are still standing on their phone like, hey, I don't care. If we honor the prime minister that does some of us, the prime minister don't even know us or is doing anything for us um, individually, specifically. But a pastor that comes and prays, lays hand, counsel and whatever every single day, there's little to no honor. Use the mic. A prophet has no honor in his country. <laughs> so we understand that, you know, because we're Jamaican and we used to each other, you will be up there pu putting out your, your 150 and everybody see you as, eh. but if you go overseas, you don't have to put out 150, you put in 50 and everybody pour into yes. you. So that's what it is. I can testify for my pastor as, as a female, you know, females are not recognized a lot. And she she sings songs. She used to go on YouTube with Father Minister Patricia McPherson. And I, to be honest with you, I'm grateful to because when she sings, we laugh too. And we all laugh. God forgive us, but we may laugh. Because, you know, she don't have that, you know. And she went away and came back and she when she came back, she said, guess what? She said, she said, don't want to tell us that it's new to you. I don't know. <laughs> when she came back, she was saying, guys, I'm on, I'm on the, the, the something, the something. <laughs> and when me out here, the other don't even want to listen to me. And I went overseas. And when I went overseas, when I sing, they put me on the something. They honor her. You know, she was trying to let us know that, you know, we know Anna, but yeah, she go overseas and she get people to recognize our song and our song is on YouTube right now. Yes. So that's what I, my husband was talking to me recently and he said the, 
I was actually supposed to leave July for a revival, a revival in Alabama, but it's not going to work out this year again. And he said to me that um, the revival you're praying for, what if it is not Montego Bay, but it is somewhere else? Um, it was just a thought, but we definitely, revival is definitely coming to Montego Bay, definitely. But one of the things that I thought about was um, when I just started pastor and I was at Rose Hall, I remember um, on Saturdays, I used to have church in Kingston on Saturdays, and then on Sundays, we would come down to Rose Hall. And, and when I go to Kingston on Saturdays, uh, the way I preach and I press him on to go, I don't do that in Kingston. Even since we've been in this church, the way I minister in Kingston, I don't do it here. For example, I was at Kingston just, just since this year, a couple of months ago, at um, the second branch in Kingston. And I say, everybody lift your hands. Father, let the heavens be open. I declare and I decree in the next 10 seconds, there's a mighty shift that's about to happen. And before I say, Carletta, before I say about, and I haven't even said happen, people are falling, bam, bam, people are lit. Uh, and I'm, I step back and I say, God, we're never ready yet. I'm literally telling God I'm not ready yet because people are just falling just like, like crazy. People are having out-of-body experiences. There's one young lady. I, well, there's one young lady. She, uh, the Holy Spirit pulled me up and I began to watch her. And I said, God, please do not let her die in my service because I'm going to have to pray to bring her back. She was literally in the courts of heaven and you could tell that she was in heaven. Her language had changed. Her the atmosphere around her had shifted completely. And God had given her seven golden tokens. When she shared it with me when I left, I was completely blown out of my mind. It was easy. When I came here Sunday, uh, after 10 seconds, the Holy Spirit go move. We're going to do it one more time. Drum and musicians, get ready, play. And we're doing this thing all three times before anything happens. Now people are literally standing and looking at me and I'm, God, why are these people getting it? It is it's a different atmosphere, a different culture. People in certain places, people are hungry for God. And when the anointing and the glory comes, listen, they soak and they bask in it. If you're not careful, if you're not careful, you don't understand culture and timing. These things can make you very discouraged. You have to understand. There are days here where the glory is extremely marvelous, where worship is marvelous. I've never seen it anywhere else. But there are some things that take time. And I think, the, I think there are many things that we have to unlearn and teach certain things where honor is concerned, especially where youth will come in. And I believe where Prophet Carter said 2,000 youth, I believe that God is sending the people. I've seen it. I've never met anyone that have not had that dream for elevation and center where there are massive crowds and so on. I've never had a speaker come that have not shared the same thing, whether they know each other or not. God has spoken. And I believe that this is one of the reasons why there is so much fight and there is so much warfare. The witchcraft level has increased drastically over the past two weeks. We've constantly been finding witchcraft stuff all over the place. It is amazing. It's phenomenal. And I believe one of the reasons why the devil is really fighting um, this ministry, and not just our ministry, but others as well, because especially where there's about to be a youth culture, because youth can learn and they can grasp certain things. When you talk about youth coming in and you will teach them honor, you'll teach them respect, you'll teach them the true, the true essence of ministry and worship, the devil will fight this by all means because the youth will get it. Some of the older, tough food people, they might, I'm sorry. Some of the older folks, they will not get it. You can't bend or break that tree again. There are some that will not get it. But the, the youth who are coming, you can teach and you can train them to walk in certain things. You get what I'm saying? I, I mean, there are some, I mean, the older folks, let me, let me, the, there are some older folks that they have this thing set in them. As some used to church, as such church supposed to go, if it is not done this way, then it can't go no other way. Or some of them are so bossy. What I say, it is what goes. You get what I'm saying? Uh, but we're moving by the presence of God. Whatever God teaches us to do, that's what we will do. We move by the waves of heaven, the currencies of heaven. So that's what I mean by that. 
um, for example, I have Sister Peggy and I have Prophetess. Uh, listen, what I love about Sister Peggy, and I wish that, listen, I wish, and this is why I'm correcting myself to some extent, I wish that my youth had a heart like Sister Peggy. When worship turn up, there's no way you'll find Sister Peggy just sitting or standing. She's on her face at the altar, and she reminds me of myself so much. When I was just coming into ministry, and I was not doing the whole ministry and so on, whenever there is worship, I'm on my face for the entire service. Nobody can get me up. So as much as Sister Peggy is a senior gone ahead of us, if some of our youth had the heart like Sister Peggy, oh wow. And the same thing goes to prophetess as well. She has a heart for worship. She's gone down when, when, the, when the presence of God becomes heavy. And that's what we're really pressing and seeking for, that God will train us and that God will teach us the essence of worship, the true essence and depth of what honor is. So we can have, uh, we can do this thing called ministry and kingdom work seriously for God. Amen. I've said a handful. I think I need to uh, not preach for a couple of Sundays and do like a training for the entire church because I think the entire church needs this. Um, let's do worship leaders real quickly and then we can close for today. We have five minutes, just one hour, 55 minutes. Time flies when you're having fun. Worship leaders. Uh, wor the role of a worship leader is one to usher the presence of God into the church. It's pretty simple, but it's very profound and very powerful. They usher the presence of God into the church. They set the atmosphere and the tone for the rest of service. And if they set the atmosphere and they usher in the presence of God, then healing becomes easy. Deliverance becomes easy. Preaching becomes easy. The entire service becomes easy. Now, the role of the worshiper is not just to worship, but also to pray and intercede, to worship in private, not in public. If the, if the worshiper or the worship leader does not have a private worship life or prayer life, they will not be able to shift the atmosphere publicly. So if worshipers cannot get the presence of God Saturday night, then they will not be able to get the presence of God on Sunday morning. Your worship begins from Saturday night or even earlier in the week. So in other words, you can't take a people to a place that you've never seen before, that you've never been. If you've never worshipped before and had angelic encounters, there's no way you can open a door for angelic encounters to happen. So as worship leaders, we must press and seek for the higher things in God, the deeper things in God. We must, the deeper things of God must call and beckon to the deeper things in us from Saturday night. We must be laid out on our face on Saturday night, seeking and crying and bawling out our eyes to God to get his presence. So when you come on Sunday morning, you can just go into the realms of God and you can bring the people there with you. But if you've never be been there, you can't take anyone there. The, the duty and the role for each leader in church is go straight across the board. Well, can you imagine what kind of church will be? Lord, please send the, send the right people or help us all to understand exactly what you've called us to do. Can you imagine every Saturday night, I, 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 re I realized that over the past couple of um, weeks, I've been sleeping and I've been so tired and I've been sleeping really hard. The, the warfare has been so crazy. I've been praying and I've been so tired. And I realized I had to set, I had to set, um, I had to set a, what do you call it? A timetable. And I have listed out the days throughout the week that I will pray at whatever time I will pray. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or whatever it is, I will pray from 12 to 4 or whatever. And I put a list. On the other remaining days, I will make sure I study my Bible at least for this time. And there are certain things I put. Make sure you do your Facebook Live, whatever it is, just to make sure I'm holding my own self accountable. On Saturdays, I ensure every Saturday 
that when it gets to, th I'm out of my bed from at least three or four every Saturday morning. Three o'clock, four o'clock, can't catch me in bed. Such I'm um, Sunday mornings rather. So I'm up from three, four, praying, preparing for church on Sunday. Not preparing sermon, but praying and seeking the face of God. Can you imagine while I am praying and getting ready for church, that the intercessors have prior been praying and praying over the church atmosphere, and the worship leaders are also seeking the presence of God for worship. Can you imagine when everybody have sought God and come to church Sunday? What a catawampus time we will have in the house of the Lord. That would be a day where preaching will not be possible. It would just be worship. We're just on our face worshiping God. We've encountered it before and we want to, we would love for this thing to be an every week thing. We would love for this thing to be an e prophetess caught onto that. <laughs> we would love for this to be an every week thing where I honestly, I've, I've only been preaching as a pastor for two years, um, outside of that for numerous years. But I'm tired of preaching, and I would love for us to just come here on Sundays, and the worship is so deep, the pra praise and worship, the worship, the flow, the glory of God is so heavy that I only get to speak for at least five, ten minutes. And that five, and that ten minutes of, of encouragement and word is so profound. Does that make sense? Remember one Sunday we were here, prophetess, and the glory of God was so heavy. I had to sit on the stool, and that day I had prepared a whole sermon, but it wasn't, the, it wasn't what God wanted. That Sunday I spoke about the love of God, love. Remember you were here, Carletta. I preached on compassion, and it was preaching. It wasn't the kind of preaching that was charismatic and all over, all over the place. But that Saturday when I spoke about compassion, it sat in our hearts. I will never love the same way again. And that was very powerful. I think we have become, I'm about to close. I think we have become so cultured to the one hour, 30 minutes or two hours of preaching that actually it almost does nothing for us. We get excited, we get pumped, and we're energetic. And then when we go home, we go home to the same sickness, the same problem, the same thing. And the preaching is just a bag of excitement and nothing happens when we should be spending as much time in worship. Where does it make sense we're preaching for all? one and a half two hours and we don't even get the presence of God I think this is why the devil fights this church so much because I don't want the same the regular old regular the same old same old church has to be church with a difference and if it takes 20 years you gonna get there but church cannot be church as per usual so if you're called to be an intercessor you should be praying from Saturday or Sunday morning. Four o'clock should not catch you in your bed, Carlito. There's no way you're an intercessor. And at 4 or 5 a.m., you're sleeping in bed. And when it gets to 6, 7, you're just awake up for cut up color luma, make breakfast and iron. There's no way as an intercessor you can be ironing your clothes on Sunday morning for church. No way. The same thing goes for praise and worship leaders. You should be up worshiping and listening to those worship songs and seeking the presence of God from at least 4 a.m. Sunday morning. So when you come to church, you're coming with your own atmosphere. When you come to church, you're coming with fire. You're not coming. There are some people, oh, my God, I'm at church so somebody can encourage me, somebody can tap into the atmosphere of church. No, you're coming with your own praise. You're coming with your own fire. You're coming with your own shouts. When everybody come together collectively, Tonita, a problem. I know not unusual. So, since it's the last day for School of the Prophets, I, I, I charge you today, let's change our approach for church and ministry. Let us change our approach. Set your alarms. Come on, go ahead. Set your alarms right now. Everybody, pull out your phone real quick. 4 a.m. Set your alarms. If it's at 3 o'clock, let it stay. But set your alarms. Come on. Um, Tanita, everybody, set your alarms. 4 o'clock. Those who are online, Charmaine, if you're going to church tomorrow, Mrs. Shaw, all of you guys who are online, Natasha, let's set our alarms. Kerry, let's set our alarms for 4 a.m. I'm giving you a charge. Let me, what is my alarm on for? 
Let, let's help our pastors. Let's not exit this class the same way that we came. Let's help our pastors and our leaders to have church with a difference. Every Saturday, your alarm should be at 4 a.m. So you're praying from force. When you come to church, you're one less problem in church, one less stressed out person. Uh, but you're praying from for you're getting the presence of God. As an intercessor, we must leave this class as an intercessor, a charge to move forward with a difference. Worship leader, charge to make a difference. As a prophet, charge to make a difference. Let's do church differently. Let's do church the right way. Amen. So we've gone through this training, not just to get the knowledge, but let's apply everything that was taught. Let's apply everything. I don't want she to know. No, my alarm said 3.25 a.m. Let me edit it. <laughs> Let me edit it to 4. <laughs> Let's apply everything that we have learned and make a difference. Let's move forward, building the kingdom of God. Everything that you have learned, that you have taught, if you see something that is not right, something that doesn't make sense, something that is missing, there's a gap, let's take it into prayer. Let's pray about it. Be a list intercessor. Put the list together. Let's pray about it. If you can talk to your leader, talk to your leader. We don't have a youth department. Let's try to put a youth department. What about the intercessory team? Let's put an intercessory team. We don't have a set of people that um, honor and care for our pastor, help our pastor. Let's begin to do this. Let's begin to do that. So we're looking for things to do in the body of Christ. Do not just go to church and just sit and not do anything. If, if they're not going to give you the opportunity to preach on a Sunday, then make sure when you go there's no sweetie paper on the floor may initiate be 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 the initiator do something in the house of god make sure there's no sweetie paper the compound is clean there's nothing if you can't preach clean it starts somewhere it starts somewhere so let's let's do something we've learned so much there has to be something that god has called you to do with it the prophet the apostle the evangelist the church cleaner the usher we've done so much something must fit you one of the hearts must fit you so that's what we're doing as we move forward father let's all pray in the holy spirit let's all pray in the holy spirit Father, we honor you and we bless you. We give you thanks for this class. We give you thanks for the opportunity that we could have all been here. We give you thanks, Father, for everything that you have taught us. We, Father, we believe that this is not just a teaching, but this was a prophetic seed that has been planted on the inside of our wombs, on the inside of our spirit. And as you have deposited, as you have planted the seed within us, we declare that it will germinate, that it shall begin to grow. Father, I declare that the ministry within your people's life, whatever it may be, that they may begin to manifest and demonstrate what you have given unto them. Father, I declare that you would have already activated, you would have already imparted to your people and that's why they have that zeal within them that's why they feel full they feel joy they feel energetic they have hope and they can see a brighter future they can see the revival and the greatness that is coming because you have placed and you have birth out a seed of revival within their hearts and so father as we continue i pray for momentum spiritual momentum that they will continue to grow they'll continue to move in the spirit that the desire to pray the desire for worship the desire to grow in the things of god that it will not stop it will not die up but that they will continue father god to seek after you they will continue to prophesy to dream they continue to have visions and dreams they will to speak and release the word of God father we declare that as you give them supernatural momentum that they will continue to desire for you as David said that we're that our heart is panting for you as the deer panting for the waters so does our soul pass for you oh God father we declare in this season 
that you will not cause us, you will not cause your children to go back to the same way that they were, to retreat to the same place of stagnancy and dormancy. But I pray that you will cause them to come into divine alignment, that they will begin to line up to the power and the glory of God. I declare that you will not only activate and impart to them, but you will give them the grace for demonstration, that they will demonstrate the glory and the power of God. I declare that the prophets will not only prophesy, but they will prophesy and it will come to pass. They will have control over the atmosphere, the regions and territories that when they begin to intercede and pray, when they go into their homes, into their communities, that every warlocks and witches in those areas, that they will begin to flee because of the presence of the prophets. I declare that the apostles will rise for the occasion, that they will walk in apostolic power and grace. Let the worshipers begin to worship. Let them get the heart of worship, oh God. Let the worshipers get your heart. Because if we get the heart of God, then we have gotten the heart and the true essence of revival. Lord, I pray that you may shift us as pastors, that we may lead in love, we may lead in charity and patience, that we may lead as servants and not idolaters. Father, we pray in this season that you may carry us to a new dimension in you, O oh God, to a new realm in you, to from glory to glory, from high to height, and from death to death. Lord, I pray that you will cause us to become the way pavers. You will cause us to become the trendsetters. Lord, I pray in this season that after we have finished this course, that we will no longer settle for less. I pray that you may cause us to come out of dead churches. Lord, I declare that tradition, that family members, that Positions will no longer hold us in churches that will not push us forward, but that you will cause us to come into alignment, whether there's pay, whether there's money or not. But may you connect us to the right leaders all across this nation that will help us to push the vision. I pray that you will connect us, oh God, with leaders that carry a vision, a promise, that you will help us to work with them to arm a beer, to help to facilitate the vision into manifestation. Manifestation. Lord, we declare that we will never be the same again. We declare that we will become trendsetters. We will create the realm and the realm of worship. We declare that when we worship, we will make others look like they're not even trying. When we begin to intercede, we'll make others look like they're playing dull holes because we now understand the true essence of intercession. That intercession is not 10 minutes, it's not 5 minutes, but it is getting on our faces and seeking your face, oh God. It is laying on our face until it hurts. It's laying on our bellies until it hurts. Lord, we pray that you may take us into a deeper place in you, oh God. We pray that you may pluck up and dig up, gut us like a fish, gut everything out of us that will not help us on our vision, gut out the laziness, the slumber, gut out the conceitedness, the pride, gut it from the outside of us, pluck it up from outside of us, oh God, and instill within us passion and fire, cause us to burn for you, to hunger for you, oh God, for those that hunger and thirst and after righteousness, shall I'll be filled. Open us up, God. Bring us into the theater room and cut us wide open. Open us up. Remove tradition. Remove religion. Remove 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 our title and denomination remove everything that will set us apart from you oh god cut us wide up and search our hearts our motives and our intention our agenda oh god and that you will instill so within us embed within our hearts a heart and a desire for you not to be seen not to be recognized but a heart for you oh god cause us to become embalmed in your heart cause us to die daily let our flesh die and embalm us in your heart where we know what you feel what you like what you dislike what you intend to do so that we can carry out the mission for it is your heart that matters 
Because if we get your heart, we must love. If we are embalmed in your heart, then we will know what true compassion is. For compassion is the foundation of ministry. Compassion is the foundation of power. For if we have power, no compassion, then it is futile. If we have prophecy and no compassion, then it is useless. If we build a church and there is no compassion, then we are laboring in vain. So build us, O oh God a heart like yours in this season after all is said and done we don't want to end this class with just theoretical knowledge but we want to come to know you to encounter you oh god that there may be a change in our life help us oh god to do your will to carry forth your will Father, just as the great men, the ancient men, Elijah, Elisha, Joshua, Moses, TDJ, uh, 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 um, Prophet TB Joshua, the great John Lakes, Alexander Dowich, uh, Sparham, Amy Templeton, uh, Father Catherine Kuhlman, just as these great men and women of God uh, have walked the earth and they have raised the dead, they've healed the sick, uh, they've ministered in revivals. Uh, Father, we know that you can do it again. Uh, and if you can use anyone, if you will use anyone in this end time, uh, then you can use us. Uh, Father, let us hear about Charmaine. Uh, let us hear about Michelle. Let us hear about Carletta. Let's hear about Rashawn and Kellyanne. Let's hear about Tonito, oh God, that they have gone into workplaces. They've gone into hospitals and they've been raising the dead. Father, we pray that you may stir boldness, you stir power and fashion, that you will stir fer our fervency, O oh God, that our people will not just desire for an amazing day at church, but they will desire to raise the dead and with the desire to raise raise the dead and to heal the sick that the desire for intercession the desire for intercession will also be unmatched let them pray like never before let this not just be a prophetic class for all nine weeks and then there's no demonstration but raise up the ministry within us raise up the ministry within our hands in our bellies that we will do express and that people will hear about us you're not calling us all to start churches, but you're calling us to go into the highways and byways, preach the gospel. I pray that you will send Rush on into the town to preach the gospel, that you will send Michelle up to Cornwall Regional to lay hands on the sick and they will recover, that you will send Charmaine to Israel to feed the poor. I declare that every mission, every possibility, every greatness, every vision that you have placed within us, it will come to pass in this day and in this hour do it in us oh god help us to be a change to fill the gap where there's a gap to fill the void where there's a void you said in the last days you will pour your spirit upon all flesh do it god activate us a purpose impart us the measure of grace according to our faith doing us what you've never done before Increase us. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. Two more minutes. Come on, lift your voices. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Don't just be stared. I don't want you to leave here being stared. I don't want you to just leave here being passionate. But I want something within you to become activated that you will do, you will do, you will do. For God is commissioning us today. Makos andadabahas ekorabahandia. Rekas andadebekos adabas oteleba. Riandakatos ikeleba soto riandadibikas andadabahai. Hosh adadabahas ondadibia kata. Manda da has utu rikush anda da bahas ikele abahandia. Shele brekotos abanda da has ikele brahandia. Riba bababash ikoto rabas anda da bahai. Oh God, do it in us, Father. Increase us, oh God. Expand us, oh God. Activate us, oh God. Renewing us a right mind. Renewing us the right spirit, oh God. For newness, oh God. For more of you. To serve you, oh God. Jesus. Work in our hearts. Work in our hearts even now. We don't need a shout. 
We don't need the excitement, but we want you to work in our hearts. Cause us to begin to meditate on where we have fallen short. Cause us to meditate on where we have been missing and lacking. Cause us to meditate on where the void is, where we have become lazy, where we have become stagnant and purposeless, powerlessness, sinful, and cause us to step aside from these things and come into our purpose of prior intercession. Cause us to begin to introspect, spiritual introspection. Show us where we've fallen short. Show us where we have gone wrong, what we have done wrong, and cause us to begin to make it right with you again. We repent for prayerlessness. We repent for not walking in our purpose. Father, we refuse to die without being fulfilled. We refuse to die without walking in our purpose, without fulfilling uh, the will that you have given unto us, without receiving supernatural wealth, without winning souls for the kingdom of God. We refuse to die. And so we command every purpose to awake. We command every vision to awake. We command every prophecy, every prophecy and prophetic word within our wombs to arise even now. Father, we declare that we will arise, arise rise and awaken everything within us. We declare that stagnancy, we declare that dormancy, sleepiness, the slumber, the laziness will no longer take us over. But we declare that we will rise to fulfill what you have placed within us in this season. We refuse to die without being fulfilled. Do it in us, God. Do it in us. We refuse to sleep all night. While our purpose is tarrying, let us forsake the bed for the entire 10 hours. Agitate us to pray. Agitate our spirits to pray, God. For without prayer, it is impossible. Assign our angels for ministry even now. I pray and I declare spiritual, supernatural activation. Assign our angels for ministry, our angels for acceleration and ministry in the season of God. Our angel that has not been active, our angel that has not been propelling us and teaching us, creating open doors for us, activate that angel even now for each and every one of us, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We declare that it is so. In the realm of the spirit, I see angels who are standing in a line waiting to come into command. I just heard the Lord give these angels a command. In the realm of the spirit, prophetess, I see a large group of angels that were standing and waiting to be commissioned and ordered by God. As a matter of fact, it's like they were standing and waiting to be put on duty. But I saw as our hearts began to break before God, I saw God releasing and commissioning angel to, to all of us that are here even those who are online i see angels and all of them some of them uh even as i speak i see some who are youth like young tall sharp looking young men who are standing next to us and even as i say this i see like all the angels of wisdom also being released for god says that in this season we're about to do ministry the right way and the angels that i would have assigned the hearts were not ready for this next level but god says now is the season now is the time for you have not just been here by mere coincidence but I have ordered it by heaven it was under the jurisdiction of heaven that as a such a time like this would have come to pass that you would have taught your people would have heard it's not coincidence but I am getting ready to do something in the earth realm for those that will not function in what they have been taught they will teach others to also function and they will show others the way where they lack because now they know because they did not have 
have the knowledge, they were blinded. Uh, but now with knowledge, I have given sight. Uh, so we can perceive and know what we must do, what others must do. Uh, as we come into the greater works which must be done in the earth realm. Uh, for the earth realm is earnestly anticipating uh, a cry for remove of God. But I am not preparing my sons and my daughters uh, to carry the mantle to do which I have set forth to be done uh, in the earth realm. Uh, for miracle signs and wonders are not hard. It is easy. And I want to teach you. I want to show you the ways. I want to show you how to win souls and become fishers of men. For God says it is not difficult. The only thing that is difficult is surrender. And once you have mastered the art of surrender and submission and brokenness, then you have mastered the art of true power. Power is in the essence of brokenness. If I can get my people to be broken, then they can walk in the true power of my might. It is not difficult, says the Lord, but the difficult thing is for you to be broken, that your flesh may be slain. The difficulty is the flesh, it's not the power. It is not difficult for God to pour out his power. It's not difficult for God to manifest his power. The problem is the flesh, the fear, the doubt, the sinfulness, the carnal heart. That is where the problem is. I am not the problem. I clearly hear God saying, I'm not the problem. For nothing that I've done before is difficult for me to do again. Help us, God. Help us, Jesus. Help us to die to flesh. For we say that we're broken and we're saved. We say that we're ready, but the truth is deep down in the crevices and the corners. Right. We're still selfish, we're still mean, we're still conceited and full of ourselves and want to be glorified. We say that we're ready, but deep down we are not. You say you're ready, but you don't know that you are not ready. The lip service is great, but the heart service is weak. For I try the hearts of men and I know the heart of men. I hear what the mouth says, but the heart is not in alignment. For once and for all, get it right in your heart. For once and for all, just die to flesh. We're in crucial times, desperate diets, where there needs to be a change, there needs to be a difference. I have spoken. These were not just words of a daughter, but these were my words to her that there might be a difference. Hear the heart. Hear the heart of the Father calling out. And if you get true compassion, as I have and as I give, then you can demonstrate in power and you can function in ministry. But first, get compassion. It's almost like I can feel myself in the heart of God. It's almost like an, I can feel the heartbeat of God, his pulse moving, his blood rushing, feeling what he feels, loving the way he loves, getting into the vein of God. 
get into the vein of God. Kusabaha. Li krush e karababa suku tiketa naha shunde bibi katasava. Come on, get into the vein of God. Kushatatata rikushkete risukuri andadabaha. Come on, he's pulling you up into his heart. He's pulling you into his presence. He wants to do something in your life. Shatata la rahas oria. Kushkata baba 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 baba. Come on, get into the heart of God. Get into the vein of God. The love of God. Come on, he says, this is where I am. If you want to find me, this is where I am. Where your heart is now, where your mindset is now. This is where I am. This is the heart of God. Yes. Yes, God. Yes, Makura baba basa ndiribia. Shikatura baba baba basa turanda dabahai. For there are a set of people that will seek me and I will be found by them, says God. <laughs> you are my people. I know you by name. And I know you by the number of the hair on your head. I've been waiting for my people to get to this place, is God. I've been here waiting on you to get here. I've been waiting, I've been waiting, I've been waiting. With arms wide open, I've been waiting for you to meet me here. That I may show you what I want to do. That's why my words is come up higher and I will show you what must come here after. I've been waiting for you to meet me here. I've prepared a meeting place and I have been waiting for you to meet me here. Now I want to show you what you must do. In this place, build me an altar. In this place, build me an altar where you will remain in prayer and your life, your body will be the sacrifice. I've been waiting for you to get here. <laughs> I'm still waiting on others. I've been calling and I've been waiting. <laughs> I've been waiting and I've been calling. No, I will show you the wonders that you will do. I will show you the places in which I will give to you the people that I will give unto you. Jesus. 
what took you so long to become broken? For many claim that they're doing my work, but what they're doing I know not of. And that's why I've been waiting for you to meet me here. For many prophesy in my name and they cast devils out in my name. And they speak mysteries and parables that I know not of. But I've been waiting to meet you here. <laughs> I've been waiting to meet you here that I may teach you and that I may show you the way, the right way. For the way that seemed right to man leads to destruction. But the way which is right unto me is life and everlasting life. I have spoken these things and it will come to pass. If you build me an altar and if you stay right here.
you, Jesus. Thank you, God. This is a charge and a commission that God has given us. I've been teaching School of the Prophets since 2017, and I've never felt so renewed in my spirit. I've never felt so commissioned and charged in my spirit for something new, for something mightier. And I believe that God would have had all of us to be here for such a time as this. On next week, Saturday, we will have a conference. <laughs> He's doing something in our hearts. He's doing something. Yes, God. Have your way, Jesus. Yes. Yes, Lord. We can never be the same again. We can never be the same again. The cry of our hearts is that you teach us your ways. Moses said, show me your ways. We're not seeking for power. We're not seeking to be used. But we want to know your ways. We want to see your face. We will never be the same again. Yes, God. On next week, Saturday, we will worship. I lay hands, we will worship, and we'll just, we'll worship like crazy, we'll cry out to God like crazy, and we'll just get before the presence of God. As you go, I pray that God will cover you, cause his face to shine upon you, that he will bless you and keep you in all of your ways. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Take it not lightly. Take none of this lightly. For God is doing something. Even when some of you go home, even when you leave this place and enter in the parking lot, I prophesy and I declare that the presence and the glory of God will arrest you even in the parking lot. You will feel charged. I declare, I release the angels of God into the parking lot, into some of your cars. And I declare that you will be charged with fire. That you will go forth to pray, to seek the face of God, and to worship. May God arrest you like never before. That all the days and the rest of your life was to serve him and demonstrate the power of God. For many of you, your names will not be known to the nation. But there are men in your area, in your communities that will know your name. You're not like some pastors and prophets who are loved and worshipped. But many will know you because of the power that you carry. Some of you will not be pastors or leaders. But some of you, the sick will come to your house. People will take the sick to your house and you will lay hands on them and they shall recover. For I have small giants in the Kus Aprikutukotu. I have small giants in the earth realm, and I'm raising up the mantle in the earth realm. For some of you, you will do ministry in your homes. 
Some of you will do ministry in the hospitals. I'm giving, I'm giving you, I'm giving you what many pastors, many prophets, many apostles do not have. Cultivate and treasure. This is a gift. I'm giving you a gift. For God says, I'm giving you a gift. A precious gift that many do not have. Guard it with your heart. Preserve it with your heart. Be pure. Be righteous. Remain untainted. Watch and pray. Do as I say. Hear my voice and my word. And you will do exploit in the earth realm. Not that you may be known but that many might come to me through you. <laughs> I'm putting small giants in the earth. <laughs> I don't even know if many of you understand what I'm saying.
as we go, as I said before we go charge, there is an angel in heaven that God doesn't always send that just visited us. I don't know if anyone has heard it, but I heard like it was like a helicopter. The wings sounded like a helicopter, like something was spinning. I was literally looking if it was a heavy truck or something, but I heard like something just landed in the church. And when it landed, I heard like the wings just going. It's the loudest thing. Like my ears literally almost feels like it's clogged. I've never heard that before. I I don't know. I don't I, I don't know what I just it's just what I see and hear. But whatever it is that God is doing in us, let's just stay right here. Let our hearts and our spirits stay right here. And God will use us to do exploits in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I pray that you will cover us under your blood. Seal us by your blood in Jesus' name. You are dismissed until next week. Tomorrow we have service at 10 a.m. The Lord bless you.